Hey guys, so we're going to start the chapter 6 lecture videos. Um, it's on drawing, so chapter 6 is about drawing. So let's get started. So drawing is one of the most immediately and accessible ways to communicate through imagery. Um, so we'll kind of talk about how drawing is used by artists to kind of convey their imaginings or to just record what's happening or to record um, how something might appear. So we're going to take a look at Henry Moore's shelter dra um, drawings. He basically was a artist during World War II in London, and he captured a lot of the moments that happened during, you know, the Nazi bombing raids and the war in England and kind of created a valuable record of events where cameras would not function. So his drawings really um, were very important. And he was an official war artist. So we'll take a look at this piece. Uh, study for tube shelter perspective, and it's the Liverpool Street Extension, made with pencil, wax crown, colored crown, watercolor, wash, pen and ink, contact crown on woven paper. So this is a mixed media piece for sure. You can see all these different media that he used. So he was a, an official war artist. In 1940, he made dozens of drawings of Lunder, Londoners sheltering from the Nazi bombing raids. And he was an official war art, artist, which gave him kind of access to these basements and subway tunnels where people were seeking refuge from the bombings. And he made these drawings later from notes that he took on the spot. And this kind of has some illegible inscriptions on it. One of them begins with like rose here, um, maybe tunnel here. So some kind of illegible words there that he was kind of jotting down. And then uh, we can see this receding subway tunnel crowded with tensely reclining figures. And he kind of represses the details of their faces, which kind of helped transform the scene into kind of in, an enduring, you know, endurance, uh, less fear-based. Although I'd say the color palette is very um, black and white with a little bit of yellow. It kind of seems to project fear to me. And his drawings are particularly useful because the cameras would not function in the tunnels. So it was really a great way of recording what happened in these subway tunnels because they were very dimly lit. Also, if he was walking around with a camera in these damp conditions, um, s snapping people's faces with a flash or having to use a tripod, uh, that just wouldn't have worked out very well for him. And I don't think people would have appreciated the flashes of light from, from the camera either. So he also, he was able to provide a valuable record and also kind of was able to share his inner feelings and experiences of the war. So we'll talk about the drawing process. So the desire to draw comes to us at a very early age. A lot of children learn to draw before they can read and write. Some say, some say that like handwriting is actually drawing. It's just a different form. And people who no longer draw as adults probably along the way somewhere decided that they're just not good at it. So they just stopped doing it, which is kind of a shame because Drawing is just like any other skill that can be perfected through practice. So to draw means to push, pull, or drag a marking tool across the surface to leave a line or mark. That's basically what it, you know, the definition. Most people work in the visual arts, you know, most people that work in the visual arts use drawing as a really important tool, which is to record or develop ideas. And a lot of artists keep sketchbooks and this is where they kind of develop their drawing skills and note whatever sparks their imagination. And also drawing kind of serves as a, a foundation for painting a lot of the time. So if you can learn how to draw, you can learn how to paint on top of that. And so it's kind of like the gateway drug of art in a way. If you can draw, then you can easily kind of translate that into like watercolor and then maybe even oil painting and so on and so forth. 
So from sketchbook drawings, a lot of ideas can develop and reach maturity as finished drawings or complete works of art in other media. So like I said, artists oftentimes will develop an idea or start an idea in their sketchbook as a drawing, a, maybe a simple sketch even. But eventually they'll go through a process where it turns into, at the end of result, in a really impressive masterpiece that's like an oil painting. So um, we'll kind of go over that a little bit more. But we're going to look at uh, Leonardo da Vinci's facial proportions of a man in profile. And then we'll also took at, take a look at uh, Guillermo del Toro's uh, sketchbook as well. Kind of has a little bit of Pan's Labyrinth um, reference in it as well. So... We'll start off with da Vinci's facial proportions of a man in profile, 1490 or 95, somewhere around in there, brown ink, charcoal, and red chalk, um, 11 by 8, basically, 8 and 3 quarter, so. So he's kind of, da Vinci is basically described as a relentless artist that keeps sketches that supported his scientific research, so he was really actually quite the scientist as well as artist. And he kind of merged them together which, in this interesting way. His drawing of facial proportions of a man in profile shows him measuring the various ratios of a human face. So you can see that he has a grid here over the face, which is helping him to kind of measure the different proportions of this man's face. And I think he's probably potentially trying to come up with like some sort of mathematical formula for uh, people's faces. In this piece, he also decided to sketch this figure on horseback as well. So you can see, um, here's a guy here that without the horse, but his body is there. And then here's another one um, with a horse actually included. So he's kind of doing a couple different things here on this page. Um, like I said, this is a sketchbook. It's relatively informal. Okay, that's kind of how he used his sketchbook. And then he wrote himself some notes over here on the side. So we'll take a look at Guillermo de Toro's next. Um, pages from his sketchbook. It's Pan's Lab in 2006. So you can see this actually ended up getting used in the movie. Um, the monster in the movie basically had eyes in its hands, but not on its face. So and then you can see how he's writing. So he's kind of, it's almost like a diary of sorts. Um, some of Del Toro or Del, Del Toro's um, movies include The Pacific Rim, Crimson Peak, and then all, Pan's Labyrinth might be one of his more famous. At least that's the one I've seen. And he actually has rather personal writings about his desire for fame. And a few sketches of some of the strange beings that came into Pan's Labyrinth, his movie Pan's Labyrinth. So it's kind of interesting to see how everyone keeps their sketchbooks. Like I said, they're sort of like a diary, so each one's a little different. He's just developing ideas for his various movies. I'm not sure if he ended up using this idea, but it's interesting. Okay, so receptive and projective drawing. Um, there's kind of basically two kinds of drawing types or two main types of drawings, receptive and projective are the two types. Uh, receptive is used to attempt to capture the physical appearance of something before us. So basically, if I was to draw this pen uh, in a very representational way, that is called a receptive drawing. I'm trying to capture its likeness as it appears in you know, real life. So we'll take a look at Mary Cassatt's work that captured a family group in public transportation. So it's called In the Omnibus, which was probably an early form of public trans transport in the 18, late, 18, late 1800s. So Mary Cassatt is a 19th century artist and she recorded a family using public transportation. So one woman is uh, looking intently ahead while the other tends to a child on her lap. And drawing such a, as this can be professional necessity for a lot of artists because drawing like this can help them to become a better at drawing, but also help them to come up with ideas for more complete works of other media, such as oil painting or pastels. So this is actually something that she's coming up with for a th more finished piece later on. So this is kind of the starting point for one of her um, finished pieces, probably, that she's going to do 
further down the line. But she's just recording an idea here. She was probably on the omnibus, obviously saw this kind of domestic scene and decided that this could be a subject for one of her finished oil paintings or pastels that she did. And this is black chalk and graphite on paper from 19 or 1891. So, so other drawings in, in contrast are projective, which means drawing something that only exists in your mind's eye. So it's not from reality. It's completely within your own head, what you're actually getting out on that piece of paper in your drawing. So that is projective drawing. Um, so we're going to take a look at Bri uh, Martin Ramirez's drawing untitled number 111. And obviously these projective dra drawings might come from a memory or a vision or something we imagine or dream of in our sleep. So basically a work based on imagination. Um, and this is uh, going to be a train passing through uh, an impossible tunnel. So actually, I'm not sure about that train thing, but maybe I need to take that off there. But anyway, so this is Martin Ramirez. He's actually a Mexican-American artist, and he lived most of his life in a mental hospital. So this is kind of an imaginary scene that's really steeped in fantasy. So something that's totally in his head that he's bringing out in this perspective drawing or projective drawing. So this is called Untitled Drawing, figure 6.5 from the book. It's from 1953. It's gauche colored pencil graphite on pieced paper. It's fairly large. It's 36 inches by 24 inches. And it's basically these four animals on kind of these floating shelves that are created from a lot of curved lines and dash marks. And there's a lot of curvilinear line, like I said, and it's just very much steeped in fantasy. There's not much of anything that's very realistic, except for maybe some of the animals are recognizable at least. And that empty background, the fairly empty background here, kind of adds to the work because it makes it seem, a lot of these things seem to hover in space. So there's like no gravity present. And let's take a look at some of his other works just because it's um, kind of interesting. So the work to the left here is a really great piece. Um, in my opinion, I, I think it's a great use of line and color, especially color. I really like the lavender in it with the orange and the kind of this green color. The color combinations are great and the pattern used, the repetition and the line used in it are really helping to unify the piece, but also add variety. And it's impressive to see that he's able to do it with such, such simple materials. And the paper he used was often paper taken from the exam room table. So like I said, he's living in a mental institution. So he's using kind of whatever he can find. And a lot of what he ends up doing is in crayon and medical um, room or medical examiner paper that might go on the table that he's ripped off and used to draw on. And he's definitely an untrained artist. So we kind of talked about that the first chapter. He was born in Mexico and he's definitely a self-taught master of the 20th century. And he actually came to the United States in 1925 because of the political upheaval in Mexico. And he actually was an impoverished, impoverished immigrant in the California mines. Um, and he was actually picked up police by police in 1931. And he was kind of in this disoriented state. So they some people wonder if he was exposed to heavy metals in the mines, which kind of caused some mental illness, but that's really just conjecture. He was basically committed to the to a state mental hospital in California, and he spent the rest of his life there, and he started creating these compelling drawings for which he's known. Um, over the course of his life, he's produced a lot of works, 500 works, and this all imaginary stuff from his head, so a projective drawing. And like I said, he uses kind of found materials, so crown, um, and he used mark making techniques that consist of like ry rhythmic repetition, gentle shading, and later in life, he actually created collages. So moving on, let me check and see how much time we have. Oh, I better wrap up this video.